Final Fantasy VII has some of the most iconic and memorable characters in the entire history of video games. Whether it's great character development, emotional depth to those characters, or some of the most memorable moments, the legacy of Final Fantasy VII continues to extend beyond that of the original game that debuted in 1997. Spin-offs, sequels, and adaptations keep the characters alive in the minds of both longtime fans and new audiences, even more so now thanks to the recent remakes that reintroduce the characters to a new generation of players. So in today's video, I'm going to be ranking every hero from Final Fantasy VII, but with a twist. I am not going to be ranking Cloud Strife because he's the obvious number one. So we're going to give everybody else a chance and see where they fall. Before we get to the list, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. A whopping 97% of you guys who watch my channel are not subscribed. So let's change that and leave a comment down below. Let me know if you agree with my ranking or where you might put your characters. So let's go. Okay, let's get straight to it. For number 9, I'm going to go with Yuffie Kisaragi. Yuffie is a young ninja from Wutai, a once proud nation that has fallen under the control of Shinra. She is determined to restore Wutai to its former glory and sees joining the group of Avalanche as a means to achieve her goal. Despite her initial motives of wanting to steal the party's materia for herself, Yuffie proves to be a vulnerable ally, contributing her ninja skills and combat abilities to the party. In the original Final Fantasy VII, I would always recruit her because she was an optional character, but in saying that, I always thought she was kind of annoying, to be honest. And I don't think I'd be wrong to call her the comic relief of the party either. However, Final Fantasy VII Remake shakes things up, really flesh out her why, which was a missing factor from the original game, and allows the player to feel more of an emotional bond, especially because the events of the integrated DLC really give you a compelling reason to care about her and her journey. Okay, that's one down already. For the next one, number eight, we're going to go with Kate Sith. Kate Sith is introduced as a fortune-telling robot found at the Golden Saucer, who initially infiltrates the party under the guise of helping them. It's eventually revealed that Kate Sith is being controlled remotely by somebody who works at Shinra, but the party doesn't find out until a little bit later on in their journey. Now, Kate Sith's initial role, obviously, is a spy that becomes apparent as he betrays the party by stealing the Keystone, which opens the Temple of the Ancients and hands it over to the Turks. But Kate Sith later has a change of heart coming to the rescue of the party and allows them to escape the temple of the ancients thus gets crushed because there's a whole thing with the black materia the party briefly mourns kate sith but then kate sith number two shows up and it's all normal again i don't know it's really weird when you think about it but whatever though we do later find out that a high-ranking shinra executive is actually the man behind the robot which is weird because kate sith speaks in a scottish accent and reeve to westy who's the person piloting kate sith speaks completely differently either way kate sith is a really great and charming addition to the party next up for number seven we're going to go with red 13. red 13 whose real name is nanaki is a lion creature or a dog i don't i don't think that's ever really answered with a flaming tail now red 13 is found by cloud in the game while storming shinra hq being held captive by hojo I will say at this part in the original game where you find Red 13, to me, growing up was one of the coolest parts of the game. You gotta understand, in the late 90s, any red creature with fire on its tail was a win for me, and I'm sure for you too. As the story unfolds, Red 13 grapples with questions of identity and purpose, struggling to come to terms with his heritage and the legacy of his father, which is unfortunately really the only major story point and character arc we got for Red 13, but it was one of the more standout moments for me as well. I'm very grateful now with the remakes because we're getting a lot more of his personality fleshed out. He really deserves it because Red 13 is super cool. Next up at number six is probably the most outspoken of the group and somebody who will tell you quite happily to drink your damn tea. Sid Highwind at number six. Sid Highwind is a former Shinra engineer, dreams of being the first person to launch a rocket into space, but his aspirations are thwarted when Shinra cancels the space program. Sid is depicted as a gruff and a very abrasive, often using colorful language, expressing frustration with those around him. However, he also demonstrates loyalty and bravery, and has a strong sense of justice, especially when it comes to protecting his friends and pursuing his dreams. He's the ultimate symbol of stick it to the man. Sid also has a troubled relationship with Shira, who used to work with him on his space space program, but everything changed when before a launch, Shira had to do a last second repair. Fortunately, Sid then had to make the decision either to launch his rocket and see Shira burn to a crisp or cancel the mission. Thanks to this, she devotes her life to serving him and ends up living with him. He treats her pretty poorly, to be honest, and this is all part of his character arc because when Sid realizes later he was in the wrong and in later games and other media, he ends up actually marrying Shira. Super interesting. I'm also really interested to see how they'll handle this in the last Final Fantasy VII remake game or if they'll 
they'll just cut it out entirely because it's probably not PC by today's standards. However, Sid's character arc is one of growth and redemption. And as he learns to overcome his past mistakes, pursue his dreams with renewed determination. Okay, we finally hit the top five here. So my number five choice is going to be Aerith. Aerith is like a symbol of hope, a flower girl in the middle of the slums, something that really shouldn't exist. Despite the harsh living conditions, Aerith maintains a positive outlook and exhibits a gentle and caring demeanor. Aerith possesses a special connection with the planet and has the ability to communicate with it, power inherited from her Cetra ancestry, which as the game progresses, we find out that Aerith is the last surviving Cetra, ancient race with a deep connection to the planet. This makes her not only a target for Shinra, but Sephiroth as well. Along your journey in Final Fantasy VII, Cloud will have a chance meeting with Aerith, and the rest is history, of course. Aerith also plays a part in Crisis Core, sharing a relationship with Zack, and one that unfortunately ends in tragedy. And based on the events of Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth, I don't know if she's ever truly gotten over that either. However, Aerith is unfortunately at the heart of one of the more memorable moments or most memorable moments in video game history, where we see Aerith praying to summon Holy, the only force capable of combating the meteor, which is what Sephiroth is trying to bring about. And out of nowhere, Sephiroth comes down and impales her with his sword. This is one of the most saddest and iconic deaths ever. A moment that is made even more sad by the attachment we all have to the symbol of hope, Aerith. Next up at number four is gonna be Vincent Valentine. Vincent Valentine is the edgelord of Final Fantasy VII. Don't know what that means? Look it up. Honestly, <laughs> it perfectly describes him. About 25 years prior to the events of Final Fantasy VII, Vincent was a member of the Turks and caught wind of some of the dark experiments that Hojo was doing with humans. Vincent objected to this and then was subsequently shot in the chest by Hojo after a heated argument, then used as one of said test subjects. See, he was there when Sephiroth was kind of in an infant state. He had a thing for Lucretia, which was one of the lab partners there. She ended up being Sephiroth's mother and yeah, Hojo was pretty much Sephiroth's dad. Yuck. Now some extra stuff in the spin-off game of Cerberus that helps to explain a lot of what happened to Vincent. He's basically infused with the proto-materia, which makes him a vessel for a monster called Chaos. Now, this allows Vincent to transform into different beasts. Now, unfortunately, because Vincent believed that he was responsible for a lot of the tragedies that happened around him, he locked himself in a casket to sleep. He's pretty much a vampire. Yeah, he's also kind of immortal as well. It's so cool. He's dark and edgy, but it actually makes sense. He's continually haunted by the guilt and remorse over his past actions. But despite his dark past, he's driven by a sense of duty and seeks redemption for his sins. So he joins Cloud's party on their quest to stop Sephiroth and confront his own demons along the way. Coming in at number three is gonna be Barrett Wallace. Barrett Wallace, the man with a gun for an arm, known for his strong personality and role as the leader of Avalanche. He's introduced as a passionate and outspoken rebel fighting for Shinra, sucking the planet dry. He's driven, <laughs> I can't believe I said that. He's driven by a desire to protect the planet and seeks justice for the people suffering under Shinra's rule. Barrett's motivations stem from his personal experiences including the destruction of his hometown, Karel, and the loss of his wife. Despite Barrett's tough exterior and tendency to resort to violence, Barrett does have a strong sense of morality and cares deeply for his friends. He serves as a surrogate father to Marlene, the daughter of his friend Dine, whom he adopts and raises as his own, and Barrett's relationship with Marlene often highlights his softer side and adds an extra layer of depth to his character. And as a dad myself, I really do feel for Barrett, trying to do the best that he can for the little one in his life and create a better future for the ones that he loves. Now hang on a sec, before we get to the next character, don't forget to hit that subscribe button because 97% of you guys that watch my channel are not subscribed. Let's change that, support your smaller content creators because hitting that like and subscribe actually really does make a world of difference. On to the next one. Okay, we got two left. This is gonna be interesting. Number two for me is gonna be Tifa. Tifa is the caring, strong-willed, and empathetic bartender who runs the Seventh Heaven Bar in Sector 7. Despite the challenges she faces living in the slums, she remains optimistic and devoted to helping those in need. Tifa is a skilled martial artist which aids the group throughout their journey to initially undermine Shinra, but then later save the fate of the world entirely. Tifa is a childhood friend of Cloud's, having grown up together in Nibelheim. Tifa harbors romantic feelings for Cloud and often provides emotional support to Cloud and helps him come to terms with his past trauma and identity crisis. So yeah, she's likable, strong, grounded, emotionally complex, and relatable. She's literally one of the turning points in Cloud's character arcs because she's really the only person that can truly get through to Cloud when he's having his visions or he's not feeling right or he's having his flashbacks or after he gets dumped into the live stream and he's pretty much lifeless. She's also a really well-beloved member of the Italian Senate. If you know, you know. Okay, number one, if you haven't guessed it already, we're gonna go with 
Zack Fair. Zack Fair. Seen as a flashback character in Final Fantasy VII and then finally getting the spotlight in 2007 with Crisis Core, Zack is characterized by his loyalty, bravery, and determination. Zack dreams of becoming a hero and making a difference in the world. Despite the challenges he faces, including the betrayal and manipulation by those he trusts, Zack remains committed to his principles and strives to protect the ones he loves. But one of the most memorable aspects of Zack's character is his relationship with Cloud. Cloud looks up to Zack as a mentor in a way, and Zack's influence profoundly impacts Cloud's development as a character, and obviously plays a crucial role in the overarching narrative of Final Fantasy VII. Zack's story is marked by tragedy, sacrifice, and heroism, making him one of the most beloved characters in the Final Fantasy series. His legacy lives on through the memories of those who knew him, and the impact he had on the world of Final Fantasy VII. However, in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Zack is back and confirmed alive, thanks to some sort of weird multiversal stuff happening. And we get to experience Zack once again. I absolutely think Zack is a standout character, and I cannot wait for more. I'm so glad that he finally has a spotlight in a game where he doesn't meet some sort of weird fate, and yet kind of almost defies it. So there you have it, there's my list. If you want to see some more of my list, make sure to click the playlist here so you can see all of my ranking videos. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and comment down below let me know if you agree or not. See you next time.